Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 159. This episode is with the hilarious and talented Bob Bergen. We talk about so much stuff. We talk about how he wanted to be the voice of Porky Pig since he was five years old, moving to L.A., being a tour guide at Universal, getting to see Mel Blanc work, what it was like to actually achieve his dream, opening for Kenny Rogers with his one-man show, how an actual squirrel helped him find the voice for the squirrel in the Emperor's New Groove, playing No Face and Spirited Away, what additional voices means in the credits, and so much more. So let's get right into this one, friends. Without further ado, please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 159, with Bob Bergen. Theme song time. Sunday, it's papers and coffee and overcast and couldn't get any better. Beautiful, beautiful. I, you know, I actually prefer overcast to sunny, maybe because I'm like super pale. (laughs) No, 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 no. First of all, uh, I make Snow White look like she's got a suntan. Okay. (laughs) But I, 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 I'm, I'm where are you, by the way? I'm in Florida. Ironically. All right. So I'm in LA. I'm in California. My favorite, my favorite time at the beach is cold and overcast. Sunshine gets boring. Same. I agree. I totally agree. I, I'm right there with you. I get sunburned from opening the fridge. It's and, awful. And, and nice weather gets redundant. I mean, we rarely yeah. have, do you know, do you know in, in, in Los Angeles, if it rains, we never get thunder. What? Really? It never it does not thunder in this and, and never it never has. So when we occasionally get thunder, it freaks people out like it's an earthquake. I'm like, people, it's it's I grew yeah. up in the Midwest. I grew up in the Midwest and sure. you would see the you see the flash of, of lightning and then count the seconds for the yes. thunder to see how close it was. And that was called enjoyment. And today, yeah. <laughs> today in, in LA, people like you they, they call 911. <laughs> I think I heard a gunshot. <laughs> it's a, seriously, it's a drive-by. It's a drive-by. <laughs> I mean, right today, it, let me, let's see, it's, it's uh, right now it's 66 degrees and overcast. And to me, that's a perfect Oof, day. Wow. That sounds incredible. In Florida, have you been to Florida? Sure. The humidity is so high. You have to swim through the air. It's oh, always dude. just, oh. Uh, yes, I, I, I've, I've been to Florida. I've been to, to Disney World. And I'm like, you know, the, I, I, I love Disney World because of the, of the just vastness of it. Because Disneyland has like a, a, a tenth of what Disney World has. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, but it has. But it, Disney World has the humidity, and I I used to summer in Houston. Oh wow, that gets my gra- Well, my grandmother was a school teacher, and we used to go visit her for like a month, like in oh, cool. July or August. No, no, j- summer in Houston is you, you shower, you go outside, and that was a waste of time to get the shower. <laughs> your, your clothes are now sticking to you. Yeah, I L.A. actually has good weather. I've been I've been quite a few times, and it's you get the sunniness, but also you don't have the humidity, and it makes such a difference. Cause yeah, and if it, and oh. if it gets the slightest slightest bit humid here, people freeze. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How cold does it get? You know, I, it 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 depends. I mean, you know, during the winter months, overnight, we may wake up towards in the high thirties. Wow. But um, you know, the nice thing about even the summers, we don't have a, we'll have really hot days, but mm-hmm. our nights get cool. So. By the time, you know, it starts to, the sun starts to set, it might be, you know, 70s, 60s outside and you need need a sweater. But I spend, I would say, oh gosh, 85 to 90% of the evenings with dinner sitting outside. Um, Just because it's, it's, and and, you know, we've got the heat lamps in case it gets too cool. Yeah. But um, yeah, it, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm with you, buddy. I like the cool. I like the, the overcast. I like the yep. weird. Yep. Right there with you. What part of the yeah. Midwest are you from? I was born in St. Louis, uh, oh, cool. and lived there till I was eight. And then my dad moved the family to Cincinnati when I was eight in LA when I was 14. Okay. Okay. Both of those prior places snow. And I got to tell you, when I first moved to LA, I was like, I will never, ever ever miss the snow yeah. <laughs> i don't i don't ever want to shovel a sidewalk and, yeah. and today today i would love to wake up on a december 
January morning and see the, the, the frosting outside and to see the snow come down. Yeah, because I got we've, we've had ninety degree Christmases. That's depressing. Yeah, <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> you know, I think I think when Jesus was born, it might have been ninety degrees. Right. But right. But but that, but that's not Christmas. No, <laughs> you're not wrong. You're not wrong. We go to the beach on Christmas here, and it's there. You go. It, it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't yeah. feel right. <laughs> Yeah, I I always wonder with people who grew up like in Florida or in LA and stuff like that how well they do with the cold because your blood thins out. And right. It's, like my wife is a native here and she uh-huh. does not handle cold well. Uh, it's so in, it's so interesting to see people who put on a sweater when it's eating. It's true. It's true. Yeah. And like don't know how to wear a scarf or anything right. like that. Like I don't know what right. I don't know what this does. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> That's great. You know, one of the one of the biggest reasons I wanted to talk to you was because I I love people who like for some reason picked something like very, very young and is like, I want to do this and then stuck with it because that never happens as a kid. You know what it I mean? Kinda, it's like it sort of doesn't. It, it always, you know, most of my friends, even after they graduated college, they're like, I don't know what the hell I want to do. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you're a little kid, as the wind blows, you change your mind. I want to be a, a fireman. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a baseball player. I want to yep. whatever. And I was I was pretty driven early on and never wavered. In fact, it's a good thing I never wavered because I didn't go to college. I didn't I didn't have a, a follow up or a backup. I just was very driven. I love that. I love that. I I remember I went to a seminar one time. I used to sell uh like kitchen knives, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, one of the many jobs you do. And uh, I remember they gave this like seminar and it was like they did this study of like harvard graduates and people that went on to find success and one of the things they realized was the more specific your goal is the higher probability of it happening is i agree that i i listen that's one of my philosophies another one of my philosophies is that um uh if (laughs) if you strive for excellence rather than seek uh handouts if mm-hmm. you if you own failure, listen, we can't succeed unless we fail. Facts. I mean, I listen, uh, the mistake you'll make is failing again, doing the same <laughs> mistake. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But I, I am I am a result of the failings because I, listen, everybody fails. You're, you'll, you'll continue to fail. But I was yeah. also very, very driven and very passionate and did not take no for an answer. And I think that's one of the reasons my parents had a lot of faith in in my uh, career choice because they saw at an early early age, no, nope, nothing's going to stop me. Sure, that that makes a lot of sense, actually. So being from the Midwest and you had parents, what was yeah. it like when you're like, okay, so here's the deal? Because you wanted to be Porky Pig, like from the yeah. beginning. How does yeah. that conversation happen? Well, you know, if I had said to my parents, I want to be Superman, it was the same thing. You know, it's like right. That's nice. That's, yeah. that's, that's 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 fun but but i mean i didn't jump out of windows right you know, um wanting to be a superhero but i did i was obnoxious i mean when, it, when a teacher would ask me a, when a teacher asked me a question in like you know first grade i would answer like porky pig oh yes. and and um you know i would i remembered my mom came i come from a from a family of educators and my mom oh cool uh she she quit working as a teacher full time when 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 my sister and I were born. But she once we were school age, she would volunteer at school and work right in the on. office. And I would come home, and there would my my teachers would be there having cocktails with my mother. And I'm, this is not fun. And they would <laughs> and they would they would all give me the look, and the look meant tell, tell your mother what you said in my class today as for the pig. <laughs> but I'll tell you that my mom. My mom used to tell a story that when I was like five or six years old and you know, it was Saturday morning and I'm in the living room watching cartoons with my Captain Crunch and she's in the kitchen reading the paper or doing the dishes. She could overhear the cartoons and then she would hear a line and she'd hear the line repeated and she thought that was strange. Like it was a, a like a, a record repeating or something. Yeah. And then she, she stood behind me and she saw that I was mimicking the cartoon back to the cartoon. What? So she, she kind of saw that I had this. I guess, uh, innate talent for this. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think at that time she thought, here's a career for my nice Jewish son. Be the right. person um, <laughs> But I, mean, fair. I was, I was um, you know, until we moved to LA, it was literally just a fun hobby. That's incredible. 
like especially from like i imagine <laughs> from your teacher's point of view or your other classmates or, like the guy that like did porky pig all the time in class is porky pig like that never yeah, happens but, <laughs> it's so well, cool but, but you know what i also you know when i when i when i was in st louis as a little kid i went to um i went to elementary school with lou brock jr lou brock's son uh, oh famous, famous st louis cardinal yeah and um lou brock jr in first grade was an amazing athlete you know you're born with talent i totally. think you're born i think you're born an athlete you're born an actor you're born a painter I agree. Uh, but you need you need you need training and you need incredible discipline yes if you're, if you're going to ever succeed at it and i had both i had i had i was born with the drive and the discipline and i had parents who when we moved to la uh basically just agreed to pay for my my acting and voiceover classes as long as i kept a c average in school hell yeah that's not a bad deal i thought it was a pretty good deal because i was a terrible student yeah so, um, <laughs> same I, same I, and by the way by the way um a c average for me was not a struggle but it was definitely not easy because i didn't give a damn about school <laughs> I can remember one time being in geometry or, or algebra class, and I was asked to come to the board with a piece of chalk, chalk to solve a problem. I looked at it, handed the chalk back to the teacher and said, I'm going to be Porky Pig. I don't need to know this shit. <laughs> you just knew. What a power move, Bob. Well, I didn't really know what the outcome right. was going to be. I just, I, just, I just knew that I was going to try. Right. How is multiplication going to help me become a Looney Tune? I don't think I, so, Teach. I, today, I have a calculator and spell check. Who that's all you need. That? Yeah, Agreed. Right. Agreed. It's both in your phone too. It's like, come on, come on. And I have, a, and I have an, and I have an agent to read contracts. So yeah. <laughs> you're doing all right. You, you, it worked out. Yeah. <laughs> that's really exciting, though, to to decide you want to be Porky Pig super young and then move to L.A. Not bad. Well, that was that was that was fortuitous because yeah. you know, you know, I was I was in junior high, and you know, usually when you're in junior high and your father says we're moving. That's you're like pissed. No, yeah. I don't want to move. I got friends. I got, you know, and, and, and my dad says we're moving to Los Angeles. And I'm like, dad, you wouldn't, you wouldn't lie to me, would you? Right. Come on, <laughs> really? Come on. <laughs> and I probably would have made my way out here eventually, but sure. the fact that, 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 that dad did that for me at such an early age, that was, that was, that was pretty cool. Yeah. That's amazing. And I, and I've read that you also like, straight up went yellow pages it was like i'm not waiting around for nobody well basically it. even before we moved i mean my dad was oh really months. yeah my dad was commuting for about six months and i'd be like dad do me a favor um when you when you when you get to a hotel room go to a for animation or c for cartoons in the yellow pages and just rip out some pages for me and Dude. he brought me he brought me home i mean i that's i believe criminal but he yeah. brought me home <laughs> you know i had Good. the phone number of hanna barbera i had the phone number of disney studios i had i was i was just prepping for when i get to la yeah uh just to pick up the phone and let as as, as the uh commercial used to say let your fingers do the walking and i'm saying something that people are like well some people right now are listening to this brian going what's a phone book yeah i know that's true <laughs> i just aged 15 years bob Please, exactly <laughs> yeah or phone booths did you have you ever used a phone booth you had to have, sure right? of course oh my gosh when yeah. I, I was a tour guide at universal studios oh what when did you do that 82 to 87 dude and you and what year did you move to la uh 78 that's cool. So, yeah, so I got I, got, I became a tour guide when I was eighteen. But I had, those were the days of pagers. I got my first agent when we got to high school. But I I wasn't making a living at, at acting for the first five years I was in the business. Right. So I'd be on the in the middle of a tour, and my pager would go off. I remember one time we were in front of the Leave It to Beaver house, and I knew that there was a payphone in there. Oh, sweet. So I said, I said to the driver, I got to go make a quick phone call. I'm up for a cartoon. And I, I said to I, the driver stopped and I said to the group on the tram, I'm going to go see if Mrs. Cleaver has some milk and cookies for us. And as I walked across <laughs> the lawn, as I walked across the lawn, the sprinklers turned on because they were on automatic timer. And I looked at the group on the tram and I said, oh, that Eddie Haskell, what, what a trickster. <laughs> and, and behind the fake facade was a payphone. And I called my agent from that phone. So the bottom line is, yeah, I've used, I use many a payphone. That's incredible. That that there's that yes and. That's a that's well, a fine tuned muscle. I'll tell you a very. I don't know. Do you know who June Foray was? Oh, of course. Okay, so June June was a really good friend of mine. Legend. 
And she told, yeah. And, and for people who don't know her, she was uh, Rocky. Rocky. Yeah. And she was, she took over for Granny in, in yeah. the Lincoln's franchise from B. Ben and Derek. But she told me a story that back in the 50s, um, Jay Ward, animation producer, took her to lunch to pitch her the idea of Rocky and Bullwinkle. And it's a martini lunch because everything was a martini lunch back then. Of course. And she was listening to this pitch and drinking her martinis and loving it because it was pure adult satire and farce. Yeah. So after lunch, she went to a payphone to call her agent. And she was a little bit drunk, but excited. <laughs> and she said, no, I'm not that drunk. It really is about a talking moose and squirrel. <laughs> and, it, and, and it's a satire on, on the Cold War. No, I'm not that <laughs> drunk. I'm telling you, I'm, they asked me to play a squirrel. <laughs> That's amazing. Is and there's a talking moose and just listen listen to me. It's a and cold takes, war moose. <laughs> takes place in Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and, and the squirrel flies. Yeah. <laughs> oh God, the days. Those were the days, huh? The days. <laughs> That's nuts. So you so you got out there, right? I I've yeah. heard you. Did you really get like call Mel Blank? I don't. I not only call them. I tape the conversation, which is complete, <laughs> it's completely illegal to do that. You know, of course. That. But it's been over forty years. I think I'm off the hook. Legally, I think so. But, uh, I yeah, think statute yeah. of limitations are way past. Come on. I think so. Yeah. And I'll, I, yeah, I'll protect I, you, Bob. God bless you. Well, I, I I posted I posted the phone call on my website, so it's, <laughs> it's there for the world to hear. <laughs> but Good I, man. Um, yeah, I I didn't think I was being unusual. I thought you know if you want to be a baseball player, call a baseball player. Um, yeah. I found his, I'm not, it's a long story. I'm not going to repeat Please? it because I told, I told him many times, okay, but no. I found, I, I found his phone number in a phone book, phone book. And, um, I, uh, you know, how'd you get my number? Uh, well, of course. Yeah. Fair uh, question. He was, very, he was very nice. Um, uh, half the tape is missing because I listened to it so much over a couple of weeks, the first couple of weeks that the tape broke. <laughs> and sure. it, it, like, you know, you know, an old cassette tape that gets stuck oh, in yeah. the rotor and stretches and breaks mm -hmm, and, I, mm -hmm. and i and i and i threw it away and my mom retrieved it and put it in her dresser drawer and about i don't know 20 years ago she was cleaning out her dresser drawer which shows you how often she cleaned her dresser drawer <laughs> and found the tape and i had it digitally enhanced and i put it on my on my website but the part of the conversation that's missing is when mel blank I asked him if he still does cartoons for Warner Brothers, and he said no. They they closed their animation studio back in the late '60s, but he does the occasional commercial special toy, and he said that week or that upcoming week they were recording a um uh a, a, like an arena show, like a stage show with the Looney Tunes, oh, a musical stage show. Cool. Um, he didn't tell me the day or the time of his session, but he did mention the name of the studio. So I called the studio, pretending to be his assistant. And oh, I said, hi, uh, I'm calling for my boss, Mr. Mel Blank, to confirm his appointment. And I just literally pulled this out of my ass uh, for, <laughs> for, for, for Thursday at 11. And they said, well, we have him on, on the books for Wednesday at nine. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm looking at the wrong day. I'm so, so sorry. Yep, we'll be there. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I told my mom, look, I'm skipping school on Wednesday and you're going to take me to watch Mel Blank work. And she said, cool. So Dude. when we got to the studio, I said to the receptionist, hi, we're, we're guests of Mel Blank. He, he invited us to watch. And she said, oh, he's, he's in that booth over there. And she pointed to his booth. And I walked in this booth and I said to his producer, hi. I said, hi, we're friends of the receptionist. And she said, we can watch. <laughs> and I watched him work. It was it was it was magical. Dude, I see. That's the kind of drive that makes your success unsurprising. Because like, I, all, I, I didn't think it was unusual. I really did not think it was unusual. I thought, you know, you want something, you go after it. And the worst thing you're going to hear is no. Damn right. And like, there's no, there's no rules as well. That's the other thing is it can be so like, you have to go this way to get to that. And you're like, I don't think so. That's no, you, if, so you look cool. at, if you, if you, if you, if you look for a formula, if you're looking for anything linear, it doesn't exist because yeah. people say, what's the secret of your success? And well, it's a combination of, hard work passion uh drive mm -hmm. uh timing luck um knowing the right people and yep. and and not giving up because you know even a successful actor has ups and downs and i'm no i'm no uh i'm no stranger to downs but you know 
again, like I said earlier, you learn from mistakes and some things are completely out of your control. You know, there'll be yeah. shows get canceled and you'll, there'll be a reboot and you're not part of the boot. And um, they change creatives at the, at the studio and they decide, uh, well, we're moving in a different direction. But sure. if, you, if you want longevity in this business, you're doing more than one thing at all times. So totally. uh, yeah, that's just, but that's any, that's success anywhere. You know, you, you just, there's, there's no one formula. It's a combination of, uh, of things. Yeah, I think so too. What, so what was that like? Like, cause you, you wanted to be Porky Pig, you know, mm-hmm. Metal Blank, and then you go to LA, you talk your way into Booth and you got to see him work. Like how wild yeah. is that? It's pretty cool. It was pretty yeah. amazing. Um, he was, uh, he came from the old days of radio. So he dressed yeah. to go to work. He wore a, you know, a double breasted suit and a oh, top, wow. little flower in his lapel. And he was smoking like a chimney. And uh, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, it was, it was, it was interesting because he was doing all the Looney Tunes, but when he did Tweety, it was terrible. Oh, and no. I looked at, I looked at my mom and I went, Oh my God, he sounds like crap. <laughs> and and they played it back and it was perfect. And I said to his producer, what did you do in the playback to make it sound so, so, and she said, good. I said, yeah, that's the word. She said, yeah. he sped his voice up. Oh. I said, I said, you sped his voice up because of his age and his smoking. She goes, no, that's how most of his characters were done. Wow. Which I didn't know because when you watch a cartoon, you have no idea how they're produced. Yeah. I didn't know that until just now. So yeah, Daffy Duck, if you slow down Daffy Duck, you get Sylvester. If you speed up Sylvester, you get Daffy Duck. It's the same what? voice. Uh, Tweety and uh, Henry Hawk are the same voice. They're, they both come from like a Bugs Bunny. Yeah. So, you know, so when I do Tweety, I do Tweety like this. <laughs> oh, hello, Brian. <laughs> you, can, you can go, okay, that's, that sounds like Tweety. <clears throat> but when you speed him up, it sounds really like Tweety. Yeah. That's so nuts. I love voice actors for that reason. It's like there's so many there's so many layers that you don't know that's going on to do a character. Oh yeah. It's beautiful. Oh yeah. And and you know when when it comes to a classic character or you know even a franchise that's been around forever and ever and ever like a Scooby Doo, um you, every time you work for a different producer or a different director, it's their uh slant on the character or the franchise. Right. So you've got to be malleable. You've got to be able to take uh, what you've done with the character or what you do with the character and adjust it accordingly because it's not your choice. It's theirs. Oh, that's a good point. It's a good point. Do you find it more stressful to like do an original character that like you're starting versus a character that's like super well known? Nah. No, 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 no. I mean, the thing with a a classic character uh, is everybody is entitled to an opinion. Yeah, that doesn't sound right. Sure, um, but when it's original, nobody can say ah, you're a little off because it's original. Oh, never true. Heard it before. <laughs> That's but, true. But you know, when it comes to a classic character, or even an impression, you know, uh, everybody is entitled to an opinion because everybody's ear hears it differently. Ah, uh, true, true. That makes sense. I I did listen to the demo tape that you made really young on your website, and it's wild. It's oh, like well, I, I, you know, I, I the one I gave to Casey Kasem. Yeah. Like, yeah, I wouldn't, what? I wouldn't call I wouldn't call it a demo tape. It was literally a uh, portable tape recorder, record, stop, record, stop, record, stop. Oh, really? That's how you did yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> oh no, no, there was nothing. There was nothing professional about it. And I've been studying voiceover. <laughs> I've been a, I've been a student of voiceover for like four years, but back then nobody talked about the business of the business in class. Right. It was they didn't talk about demos. So Casey said, you know, make me a homemade demo, which I did, and right. mostly impre- mostly impressions and. Mm-hmm. Um, and he and he played it for his agent, and his agent decided to represent me. And 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 I remember when his agent called me. His agent's name is was Don Pitts. Um, mm-hmm. Don's like, you know, I think you're very talented. I'd like to represent you. And I said, Well, Mister, I have no idea what that means. But as long as it's after three o'clock, because I'm still in school. And <laughs> and I didn't know I'd hit the agent jackpot because Don represented. Casey Kasem and Mel Blank and June Foray and Paul Winchell and Orson Welles and cool. just the creme de la creme of, of uh, the voiceover industry. Yeah. Wow. Did, when, you, when you're doing those voices, because you can hear the stop and start. That's really funny. Yeah. I don't know. That's what was going on. Did you, oh, have yeah. like, did you have like a list of your characters and then just went down yeah. or did you spitball it? 
no, I just have a list of, of the name, you know, uh, you know, wrote down like <clears throat> Yogi Bear. Yeah, hey, this is Yogi Bear. You know, I just, I just, you know, did a catchphrase. Um, sure. No script, just, you know, but hey, it's a classic character. But I'll tell you, people today who have a desire to play a classic character, and I mean, every day of my life, I get emails and MP3s from people saying, hey, I do a mean uh, Popeye or I do a really good Homer Simpson. Of course. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll pop them a note back and say, okay, you do the catchphrases quite well. You're a great mimic. Read the front page of the newspaper and send me that back as Popeye. Send me that back as Homer Simpson. Send me that back as Barney Rubble. Yeah. And they and they suck. Yep. They suck because yeah. because they they can mimic the catchphrase perfectly. Uh, I'll give you an example uh, of where it, it 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 affected me. Yeah. When we when we auditioned for the first Space Jam movie, and I've had to re audition for Porky Pig now I think over a dozen times. Mm -hmm. Um. I got down to the wire, you know, call back after call back. And there's like three or four of us up for the part at the end. And they passed out Shakespeare. What? They figured if you could do, and anybody can say, what's up, Doc? And that's all, folks. Sure. But, but if you can do Bugs Bunny or Porky Pig uh, playing Hamlet in character, but get the words out, get the story out, get Shakespeare out, you know that character. And they passed yeah. out the copy. And I'm looking at all my, my, my competitors freaking out. And I'm looking at the script going, oh, this is great. I can nail this. This is, <laughs> this is cool. So I kind of walked into to that last callback thinking, I think I've got this one. So um, it's, it's, it's really all about character and acting and not necessarily about the voice. Yeah. And Mel Blanc, Mel Blanc died in 1989. Um, everything done since then, you know, all these old classic Looney Tunes cartoons were Today they're nostalgic, but back then they were contemporary. They were right. contemporary pop culture. So, so is the stuff we're doing today. But Mel Blanc never had to relate to a cell phone or an Uber driver or internet. And we've got these Looney Tunes characters living today's uh, world lifestyle. Right. So you need to you need to keep the integrity of the character while keeping the character relative. Interesting. And relevant. Yeah. Well, I never thought about that. That's crazy. Also, the fact that you are Porky Pig and then you have to continue to re-audition for him. That's nuts, too. I didn't know that. Well, it is what it is. I don't own the character. Nobody who does a classic character has a lifetime contract. Every time sure. I work, it's a brand new contract. And I'm not the only one who's done them. I think I've done them like 98% of the time Sure. in 30-something years. But though there have been several other people who have done them over the years, and they've done them well. Yeah, that's interesting. I feel like a lot of people don't know that. Huh. Yeah, well, you know, there there are no credits in commercials. Yeah, um, true, true. I will tell you that the Six Flag Parks are non-union, so I for sometimes they'll hire us and they'll get a union contract, but more often than not, it's a non-union deal, and I can't do it. Right, right. Did, when you're doing, like, the Porky Pig as a kid, did you, like, because I saw you in I Know That Voice, which is incredible, mm -hmm. and you, yeah. like, break down the code of Porky yeah. Pig. Did you yeah. break down the code super young, or did you later on figure out the math? No, I broke it down when I was like five. That's crazy. That, that <laughs> every every word is the same formula, and I didn't break it down like I did in that film uh -huh. because I wasn't sophisticated enough to put it into words. But I, sure. I did. I did realize that there is a formula to every word, and you know the hard part is you know making sentences. I will tell you that every time I work for a new production or a new show, they will type up they type my stutter into the script. Oh. And I have a bitch of a time finding the story because I bet. It's, it's surrounding surrounded by D's and W's and T's. And I don't say anything. If it's a series, I don't say anything in the first episode. Right. But at the end, I'll walk up to the producer and say, Hey, listen, um, it'll make my life a lot easier. If you, if you want a specific joke on, on the stutter, you know, because the Borky's whole thing is he stutters on a word and then takes a left turn. Yeah. A joke. <laughs> Yep. I, if you want to write that in, that's great. But if you write in my stutters, it's going to take me twice as long to do this because I can't find the story. So, but I, but I, I don't want to, they're doing that actually, they think to my benefit, they think they're helping me. Right. But, but it doesn't. Sure. It's like, I, I can figure this part out. This. Yeah. I got this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was it fun being a tour guide. That sounds like it could be a pretty fun job. It was a blast being a tour yeah, guide. I loved had it. To have it been. Was, I will tell you that, you know, when you, I mean, I don't know what it's like today, but because mm -hmm. this was a million years ago, but um, 
when you're training, they, they, they sell it like, you know, we want actors and we'll let you go for auditions, you know, which oh. it, it was hard to get off for auditions. It was sure. impossible if you booked the job. Um, right. And I remember back then I was still doing on camera and I booked a part on the facts of life. Oh, um, sweet. Which was, which was shot on the universal lot. And I had nice. to call in sick for five days. Um, but they had my damn trailer along the tour guide route. Oh. And every time I heard a tram coming, I would duck in my trailer. and I was, late to, <laughs> I was late to the set because I couldn't be seen because I was supposed to be sick. Right. <laughs> you're, double, you're double dipping at that point. I, a little bit. In fact, they eventually, the reason I left Universal is because they fired me. I had 32 sick days my last year because my <laughs> voiceover career had taken over. But I, and I was terrified to leave because, you know, it's just the security of a nine to five. Sure. And I'm like, well, what happens if the voiceover stuff stops? And they're like, well, you can come back. That's nice. That was a little bit of insurance that I always had a place to go back to if I needed to. Can't go wrong with that. Well, except for except for my knowledge of the of the of the of the studio stops at Murder She Wrote and Night Rider, so oh. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd have to educate myself in the last forty years. That's right. Your tour is just the really really short one. If anyone exactly. wants to just see that, you're like, this is Bob's specialty tour. That's it's, right. That's it's, right. It's six minutes, but it's great. Yeah. yeah, I'm into that. How long? How long was it before like you got to actually voice Porky Pig? Oh, uh, let's see. Um, I got my first agent in 82, Mel Blank died in 1989, and I got my first Looney Tunes gig in 1990. So it was eight years. Eight years. That's a, that's a long time to fight for the dream that you've had your whole life. And then it happens. Is it, were you nervous? Yeah. Uh, the, no, the only time I was nervous, uh, during that process, and actually the only time I've ever been nervous in my life at an audition was at one of the callbacks um, I auditioned for Chuck Jones. Oh, sweet. And, and Chuck, for people who don't know, Chuck Jones was one of the founding fathers of the Looney Tunes, along with Chris Freeling and Bob Clampett and Tex Avery. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I went to shake his hand and I was, I, was, I was nervous. I was shaking. And he said, why are you so nervous? And I said, I'm about to do Porky Pig for Chuck Jones. It's like doing Jesus for God. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, you're not and, wrong. And he laughed and it, it kind of broke the ice a little bit. And after I did my first gig, I was told that he didn't really like me, but fortunately didn't really have an official say. He was just sort of there as a, as a courtesy. Oh, I feel like that doesn't help with nerves afterwards. Well, afterwards, I already had the job. I, 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 oh, right. I By then you're purpose, in. <laughs> so, so I didn't care. I was right. curious. I was curious why he didn't like me. What he, what, what, because I you can't get any more of an expert at Looney Tunes than Chuck Jones, but right. he thought that I, I nailed the character. But I was 26, and he said I wasn't old enough to understand the complexity ah, of this character. Sure, sure, it's precious. Makes sense. Well, Makes sense. fortunately, he didn't really have a say, so all right, say. it worked out. So, like, yeah. when when you're like officially, you got the job, you're in the booth, you're doing Porky Pig. Were you able to like take it in that your dream oh. is coming true? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was, I was sitting next to uh, June Perret, and I was doing Tweety, and she was doing Granny. And it, it was, it was gold. I, and I'd known June since I was a kid because I, I met her when I was 14 as well. Right. And, and she always knew I wanted to do this character. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty surreal. Wow. What do you do after that? Like if you're an Olympian and then you spend your whole life trying to get a gold medal and then you get the gold medal, except your oh, gold medal is Porky Pig. Like, do you just like, all right, cool. I'm, I'm done no, now. <laughs> well, no, actually, my, my, my folks took me out for dinner that night to celebrate, and I was depressed. And my mom says, why are you depressed? And I said, well, I just met my lifelong goal at 26. No. Yeah. And my mom's like, you know, since you were five, you've been stuttering. Shut up and eat. <laughs> it's a good mom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I always wonder that. Like, for someone that has a specific goal, what happens when you reach it? If you're, especially someone as driven as you. When like that well, wakes you up and keeps you going. You know, I mean, I can remember the agent that I had at the time. Um, I was already working in the business. I was, I had a really good agent. I was on a handful of series and done some features. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, if I don't book this, I think I want to quit the business. And she said, why? And I said, because this is the only reason I got into it. Yeah. And she was like, she was like don't be, don't be hasty. Cause she had 10% of my income. And oh, yeah. Looney, Tunes, <laughs> Looney Tunes is like such a small percentage of my annual income oh it's yeah just high it's high profile 
Totally. So uh, I'm very glad that, you know, um, over the years when other people got the gig over me or, you know, during, you know, actors have ups and downs and disappointment. Are you, you do a character, you go to the movie to see it and you're like, oh, that's not me. <laughs> they yeah. replaced me. Um, <laughs> Hold but, on. <laughs> but, 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 and they don't tell you necessarily that they're replacing you, but hey, you know, that show this. I'm very glad that I had, um, I guess, the common sense and the maturity to go, don't, don't make it all about this one character. That makes sense. I, yeah. I another cool thing with voice actors is like your voices you will pop up in places that you would never expect. So like I I found out that you were on Gremlins. That's crazy. Yeah, that was actually my first major gig. Dude, and it's the only gig that has my real name. Oh really? Mm -hmm. If you look at the credits, uh, it, I I I joined the union. My real name is Bob Berger. Mm -hmm. And um. You know, you get it's called it's 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 complicated. It's technical, but there's a thing called a Taft Hartley, yep. which means it makes you uh, uh, a you a non-union actor uh, eligible to do a union job. Yeah. And some and somebody had the name Bob Berger. So when I went oh. to actually join the union, I changed it one letter to Bergen, which, by the way, I don't recommend to anybody because it's a very difficult thing to get used to. I but bet. Grem Gremlins, I believe, is the only credit that I have with my real name. Interesting. That's pretty neat. I, I've I've heard stories as well of people that have to change their names when they join the union because there's already one. Yeah, and I don't know if it's a legal thing anymore because I think everything is done by your social security number. Mm -hmm. But um, I it's. Look, it's 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 a hard thing to do. It took me forever to get used to Bergen. I and I didn't change it legally. I still use my real name, uh, you know, if, if on my credit cards and my driver's license. Sure. Um, but um, you know, it's been uh, God close to forty years since I've been Bergen professionally, so I'm I'm a little bit more used to it now. But I'll tell you, when I first did it, um, I was trying to get used to using it, so I'd start making like restaurant reservations under Bergen. Nice. And there's this really nice restaurant in Los Angeles called Spago. And I, I called to make a reservation for dinner. And what's the name? Bergen. And they said, Will it be Miss Bergen's regular table? And I went, Oh, he <laughs> thinks I'm calling for Candace Bergen. And I thought, <laughs> and I said, I said, Okay, because I was just kind of curious what her table was. Right. And that whole dinner, I was petrified she was going to walk in and say, Who's at my table? <laughs> Did you have a story ready? Um, yeah, it was. I'm sorry, the maitre d sat us here. I yeah, know, I, 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 I under the bus. Not, 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 not my choice. I, you may have your table back. I was just keeping it warm for you. I swear. That's right. And and when the, if the maitre d said this way, Mister Bergen, I was going to look at her and say, I don't know what he's talking about. Right. <laughs> oh man, that's always have contingencies. That's what I've learned in life. Go. Just there in case. Go. Wait, hold on. What was your first professional gig then? My very first professional gig was Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Wow. That's pretty, that's a pretty good first plunge. That was a pretty cool one. Um, and what's interesting about the character, it was 1982, mm -hmm. I believe. And it was a, it was a, a brother, sister, uh, alien couple, uh, Perfect. flying and they, and they crash land here and the earth's atmosphere destroys the brother's immune system oh. and it was just just as we were hearing about this thing called AIDS and it was it, it paralleled the symptoms which I wow. thought was wow um so uh yeah that was my first gig and I was excited about that because uh, I'd, I'd I'd watched the show and Stan Lee who was the owner of Marvel uh comics yeah was the narrator he was the narrator I was like oh I want to oh Stan Lee he wasn't at the session. <laughs> you can't have it all, Bob. I know. <laughs> did they did they record like individually back then, or was it like in a group like they do some shows now? Yeah, well, as often as they can for TV, they'll record ensemble. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, they had the entire cast there, and even today, uh, well, put COVID aside because that changed everything for this past year. But sure. Um, yeah, as often as they can for television, they record ensemble. But because we're all very busy and yeah. working on many, many things at one time, it's it's pretty pretty common to record your lines by yourself. That makes sense.
when when you're doing because you talked about like you have to be doing multiple things at once and you are super busy and you're doing so many things when did you have time to make a one-man show oh um well it's an interesting story hey. um, i it, it was about 20 something years ago mm-hmm. and um i was i actually, actually i started this idea as a as a pilot script for a sitcom Ooh, okay and and i was working with uh my manager at the time and it was about think think taxi for a a movie studio tour break room so it was universal Ooh. studios meets taxi i'm in and, and we we started talking about all the people i worked with and, and their personalities and um and my manager said um would you be able to present this like a one-man show uh so we could invite networks and studios to watch can you perform all these characters and i said probably and as we're working on it he said you know why don't we make this three acts act one is the kid who wants to be porky pig act two is the kid who has to work as a tour guide to eat and pay the bills and act three is the kid who books the job i said great love it so we we staged it at uh an apartment complex in burbank and he videotaped it uh, it was like a rec room for the and for for people who lived in this this, this it's the barham apartments or the, the oakwood apartments in bar in barham mm-hmm. and people in la will know it because it's pilot central people fly and stay there short term to to shoot and book pilots oh gotcha and so there were tons of actors there and i i was working on three by five cards fantastic and and just i I had nothing memorized and my manager taped it and he played it he played the tape for a friend of his who was also a manager and his manager friend asked to take a meeting with us and he said, look, I, my client, Kenny Rogers, is finishing up his, his yeah, West look. Coast summer tour, and he needs an opening act for the next five cities. What? Would you, would you be able to take 20 minutes of this and be his opening act? And I said, well, and my manager said, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and I think this meeting was on a Tuesday. So well, when is this first performance? And he said, that would be Thursday night. I'm like, oh, shit. Wow. So, <laughs> In 48 so, hours. That's when. Yeah. So I, we're flying to, I think Oakland was our first gig and I'm flying to Oakland and I'm trying to cut this thing in my head and memorize it. And um, yeah. And we finished what? up that, that, we finished up that summer tour and um, I was on the bus with his bandmates and it was incredible. They were lovely people. Um, came back to LA. I did, I did a staging of it at a comedy club called the ice house in Pasadena. Oh, super famous. And then I did uh, uh, a performance at a place called the White Fire Theater in Sherman Oaks, California. Oh, cool. And there, and there was a producer in the audience who said, this is a great show. I own a theater in North Hollywood, and I'd like to produce your show. And he produced my show for about three months at his theater. And then about 10 years later, I produced it myself in Hollywood, and I've mm-hmm. taken it just to sh- small gigs around the country. I did one, a little club in New York and Chicago and Atlanta, but long story short, that's how that came about. Wow. That's incredible. You got how random (laughs) to be an opening act for Kenny Rogers. Oh, that was really, really random. And then I found out his wife's name was Wanda and she was a delightful, delightful person. But I found out that Kenny Rogers hated me. Oh no! Uh, well, he he hated cartoons. Oh no! And, and I heard that through his bandmates, and I pulled his wife Wanda aside. I said, "Kenny doesn't like me," and she said, "Honey, don't worry about it. You're not up there for Kenny. You're up there to make the audience happy. So when Kenny comes out, they they they've been in a good mood. So he doesn't have to like you. They do. So Wanda, if you're listening, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's. That's so much. That's like throwing you into this whole arena. Be like, do this. Cause even your man. Wow. That's yeah, a lot was, to do in a short amount of time. Like mentally. It was, <laughs> it was scary. And I will yeah. tell you that when, during rehearsals, I kept forgetting my lines and oh, no. um, my manager came up to me and he said, look, you're not doing 
Shakespeare. You're not doing uh, Hamlet. You're doing your life story. If you screw up a line, what do they know? So that's true. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it gave me it gave me a lot of creative freedom. And I never ever did because I had no cues. I had no music cues. I had no lighting cues. Right. But when I when I staged my one man show, I had like 50, 60 cues. So I had to get. Oh, Brian, I'm such a bad I'm bad at memorization. So on stage, <laughs> on stage, I wrote down on cue, on little three by five cards on the stage my cue line, so I would be accurate for the tech in the smart in, man. In the, in the booth and i even went so far as to say after this line walk stage right to the podium <laughs> and i walked stage right to the podium with a note that said welcome to stage right i mean i was, I, 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 I fed myself lots of very very obvious cheat notes i love that it's like those pictures when it's like look at the shoulder now look at the foot now exactly. look at the arm <laughs> exactly. Exactly. honestly that's just smart oh yeah and and you know doing voiceover for almost 40 years, yeah. you don't have to memorize. So right. that muscle has never worked. Sure. <laughs> and you have to do it live in front of people. That's a lot, Bob. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. But, you know, once I got it down, sure. the, difficult, the difficult part was when I would take it to other venues um, because, oh. you know, you're, you're dealing with the, the, the tech at the, at the nightclub in New York or the oh, tech right. in Chicago. So, um, yeah, it, that, that, that was a little stressful. But you know, that's, that's theater. Yeah. That it literally theater. That's yeah. not bad. That's not bad. Yeah. Do, you've also, I found out that you are a part of my two favorite Disney movies of all time with Hercules oh, and treasure yeah. planet. Oh, there you go. Incredible. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I've never seen either. Oh dude. You're in for a treat when you do. Ooh. Okay. There okay. I, I, I don't watch it much of my work. So I, I, I'm glad you saw it. Yeah. Yeah. I did. I've seen it a lot. You also, which I did not know till recently, you're the voice of the squirrel in Emperor's New Groove. I am. What? Yeah. I, yeah. What, is, what is that audition like? I didn't audition. Smart. Um, I don't well, know how you it would. Wasn't, it wasn't my choice. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, will, I will give all credit to a casting director named Nikki McGowan, and she uh, basically hired uh, the non-celebrities, the incidental voices for... Mm -hmm for tons of animated features. And she booked me for this movie. Well, I, I, I'm going to go back a little bit further. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't a, um, a comedy called The Emperor's New Groove. It was more of a light drama called oh. Kingdom of the Sun. And we were playing Inca slaves. Really? And, wow. Yeah, That's very different. I, it was very different. And I did a day on that. And then like a year later, she calls me up and she says, well, it's now called The Emperor's New Groove. It's a it's a wacky comedy. And, <laughs> and, and there's a character with like two or three little, little lines, comic relief squirrel that I think you can play. Dude. And I said, OK, so um, and I, you know, I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. Mm -hmm. um, Mark Dindle was the director mm -hmm. and he tells me that there's a squirrel named Bucky. And a character named Kronk. And Kronk is being played by Patrick Warburton. And Kronk speaks squirrel yeah. and translates <laughs> what the squirrel is saying. Yep. And I said, and I looked at the script and I and and Kronk says, squeak, squeak, and squeak, squeak. And I said, You want me to say squeak, squeak, and squeak, squeak? And they said, No, we need you to create a language for this character, but you can understand what he says, squeak, squeak, and squeak, squeak. Perfect. And I said, I said, okay, well, can I, can, can I think on it for a few minutes? And he, and he said, yeah, sure. We took a break. And I sat outside on a bench outside the soundstage and I'm thinking and nothing's coming to me. And a little squirrel climbed down a tree up to me and stood on its hind legs. What? And just kind of looked at me and went, I'm like, thank you. I'm like, dude, <laughs> dude, thank you. <laughs> and I went, I went back in, in, in the sound stage and I said to Mark, I said, Mark, say squeak, squeak, and squeak, squeak. And he goes, squeak, squeak, and squeak, squeak. And I went, oh, <laughs> and, and, and Mark goes, yeah, that'll work. And <laughs> I did my one, one scene one day in the film and they did a test screening and the squirrel evidently got high marks in the focus groups. So they wrote more gags and they brought me back for more. And then they did a straight to video sequel called Kronk's New Groove. And then we did three years on the series, The Emperor's New School. So that one little moment. Yeah. That, and it turned out to be a pretty good. So the, actually the moral of the story to any actor is 
don't don't poo poo a small part. You never know what's going to happen. Yeah, and get a squirrel coach. And get a squirrel coach. <laughs> and, and by the way, every time I work at Disney, every squirrel I see, I see, I say thank you because in my imagination, it's the same squirrel. I know it's not the same. I squirrel. hope it is. <laughs> well, I, 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 if it is, it's it's animatronic like yeah. Disney. But um, but no, I don't I don't think it's the same squirrel. But it might be it might be you know the great grandson of that first squirrel. So yes, thank you. Exactly. There's one squirrel that goes home, smokes a cigar, and is like, I made Bob Bergen's career. That's right. <laughs> and do I get any credit? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Go he got a series because of me. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> oh, man. I, you've also done dubbing as well. I, I didn't realize you were no face. That's super cool. And like Miyazaki, as far as dubbing goes, that's, you know, top of the top of the top. How cool and is that? And well, and, and, and the same casting director, Mickey McGowan. And again, I did an audition for it. Cool. Um, I went to the stage at Disney and it was produced by the people uh, at Pixar. So I worked oh. for Pixar a lot. And I didn't actually book No Face to begin with. I, I booked the, this little frog. Oh. And, and at the beginning of the film, there's a little green frog. And yeah. Um, and, uh, then one of the producers goes, you know, No Face eats the frog. Why don't we have him play No Face as well? Ooh. And so that's that's kind of how I got No Face. Wow. How long was that? Like, how long did you work on that one? Oh, uh, a day. That's so nuts. Yeah. Wow. It, I mean, voiceover, this stuff lives on so far. It's beautiful. Well, and, and, and the thing is, people will say, I'll be at fan conventions or comic cons, and they'll be like, what was the session like? And I'm like, you know, you, and I don't want to insult the question or the person asking because it's sincere. Sure. But people have to think, look at this, look at it this way. Uh, you're a house builder. You install a window. What yeah. was it like installing that window? It was a day in my life. Right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> It, it, it was level and I cocked it. I mean, you know, you, you don't, you might've even designed the window, but it was, it, it, it isn't something you hold on to. And by the time the film comes out, it could be one to four years later. So sure. you, don't, you don't remember this stuff. Yeah. That makes total sense. And the sheer like quantity of work that you do as well. I mean, you've got like, hundreds of credits. So it's like, right. It's one of 200 plus, you know, it's like, Oh, yeah. right. Right. And oh, yeah. a while ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've seen stuff that, you know, very maybe a Looney Tunes project or whatever. And I'm like, okay, I know that's my voice. I have no recollection of ever reading that script. <laughs> I have a question. What is hmm. something like when you see in the credits and it says additional voices? What is yeah. that? It's a great question. So, um, and this kind of started with, I, I think, The Little Mermaid. Um, hmm. Disney? before The Little Mermaid had not done a lot of animated features, maybe one every five to seven years. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, actors didn't even get credit in a Disney feature until the 40s, I believe. Oh. Um, Might have even been the 50s. I don't know. Sure. But um, they got a lot more characters in The Little Mermaid and subsequent movies. Celebrities are always hired for the leads. Right. But those of us non-celebrity voice actors can, in, in a scene with 20 characters, we can play 20 characters. To give us screen credit for every voice we do uh, would in, make the, the credits incredibly long. Yeah. So at some, at some point in the late 80s, early 90s, um, we, the Screen Actors Guild made an agreement with the studios that instead of making the credits go for 20 days to lump those of us who are non-leads who are, who are we, I, I call us um um oh what's the word uh, the we're, backbone like, of the piece well like an like an, like, an, like utility players and so oh yeah yeah they go and, and and for the utility players we agreed to keep us as additional voices and it also kept us in the credits and it also kept us in the residual pool because it's all about residuals. Smart. And, 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 and that's what an additional voice is. Sometimes an additional voice is um, like, uh, you know, uh, revoicing an actor in a live action movie or sure. doing, doing specialty voices uh, for a film. But 
they don't want to give away what exactly was done because they don't want to they don't want to let the audience know too many of the secrets right uh, but that's that's basically what additional voices means interesting i've always wondered that i've always wondered that it has the has like has voiceover changed like because you've been in it for so long like technology obviously has but has like the craft changed at all um the craft hasn't changed what has changed is the the complete vastness of the business. When I first got into this business, there were only three networks doing Saturday morning cartoons. And to break in was very, very difficult mm -hmm. because they, they had everybody they needed, including Dawes Butler, June Foray, Mel Blanc, right. um, and Frank Welker, and Michael Bell, and Janet Waldo. Um, they didn't really need anybody new. Sure. Today, and, back, and like I said, there weren't that many animated features being done. But today, we have 24-7 networks devoted to animation we've got streaming we've got games every major studio has a thriving animation department there there's there have never been more opportunities for anybody wanting to break into animation than today but there are more genres more styles you it's not just there there used to be a saturday morning sound when i first got into business everything was very obvious right to, today you've got very dry and irreverent and sophisticated animation like Archer yeah. or things, things on Adult Swim or Adventure Time. And you need to be able to shift your acting gears to, to fit the genre and the, the director and producer style. So there's more homework to be done. You got to research and it's easy to do. You ask your agent, who's the casting director? What time of the day is it on? What network? And who's producing it? If it's a pilot, you go back and look at their previous work that that closely parallels what you're doing. If it's a it's an existing series, just watch a clip of it and get a feel for the show. I didn't have the internet when I was studying voiceover or when I was starting out. So right. it was more of a guessing game. But today there is no excuse for somebody to, to not have a general idea of or a flavor of what to do from an acting style with this character creating the character that's always that's that stayed the same you still have to be honest in your acting and yep. original in your choices but you, you've you've got the ability to to further research what what the what the um personality of the product is that's something i never would have thought of that's very smart it's like know know the room you're walking into kind of thing pretty much and even though you, there's no room to walk into because when I first got in the business, every round of every audition was done in person with a casting director and the network people and the producers. But today, and this isn't COVID related, this is just the way it's been for the last you know 20 something years. Yeah. Your, your first round is by yourself, either in your home studio or your agent's office. And today it's, it's by yourself. There's nobody there to tell you what they want, but there's also nobody there to tell you what they don't want. So you can't make a wrong choice. You just have to commit to your choices. Ooh, I like that. There's like almost more freedom in the creativeness. Complete, complete freedom. And your bold choices may not be what they want, but if your bold choices are interesting, your bold choices that might be wrong will get you in the room for a callback where they can readjust you to what they want. But your, 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 your talent, your skill, your creativity, uh, and your solid choices swayed them enough to bring you in for more. Ah, uh, okay. I'm seeing a thread. That that makes sense. I, that's a common story as well. Like I had Jeffrey Pierce on recently, who was Tommy in The Last of Us, and he mentioned that he actually went out for Joel first, and then they liked him, but he wasn't right for that role. But then when the next role came up, they're like, "Oh, hold on, for this." So by making those choices, you are memorable for something that might pop up down the road. Well, you know what I tell my students is today's audition is an insurance policy for the next gig. Ooh, so I like it. If you don't book something, there are many reasons why a great read doesn't book. Right. Maybe they maybe they wanted a celebrity. Maybe mm -hmm. they used you for the last four shows and they want somebody different. Perhaps you're reading for the dad and they've already cast the mom and she's a lot older than you. So they want they they've changed the age of the character. But if you wow them, you're going to be remembered either for something else or they might go boy, he is wrong for this, but he is perfect for the next door neighbor. 
Right, right. So just just keep going and do your best. Yeah, yeah. Go in there. You can't audition to try to please them. You've right. got to commit to your choices and please yourself. And you know, I always tell my students that consider your audition as if you're hosting a party. The oh. party is the party is your audition. You know you're a great host. If you invite people over for a party and you're serving Mexican food and they don't like Mexican food, there's an in and out burger down the street. They can get something on the way home. But you know for a fact that you're serving the best Mexican food anybody else has ever had if they like Mexican food. But if they don't like Mexican food, they're going to know that you're a good host and you're a good cook. I love that. It's like confidence in your own thing. It may, not be their, it may not be their palate, but, but, sure. but they, they, they can't deny you did it well. I love that. That's that's great advice as well for anyone who's like trying to break in. It's like go in and stick your guns and do your thing because you is what's different and different is a lot of times better. Sometimes, sometimes. Yeah. And, and sometimes, dude, I've I've had auditions where afterwards I call my agent and I'm like, don't even submit it. It was just not my day. And she'll be <laughs> like, well, I already submitted and you book it and it's Friday. Dude. And I'm like, well, then they have no taste because I have had it. <laughs> and then I've had auditions where I'm like, I am God's gift of voiceover. That was brilliant. Nobody better. And I'll call my agent two weeks later. I didn't even get a call back. What the <laughs> heck? What's going on? Right. But, but you can't try to figure it out. You can't keep trying to fix yourself if you don't book. Right. And, you, and this, this was advice that was given to me years ago. Don't take, don't take the good times to your head and don't take the bad times to your heart. You can't get a swelled Ooh. head and you can't break, get your heart broken every time you either don't get the job or the show gets canceled or whatever. You can't, the, pep, the pilot isn't picked up because you'll go crazy. Yeah. It's so out of your control. Like, what are you going to do? At yeah. one point, at some, unless you're like Seth MacFarlane and you created the darn thing. Sure. It's, <laughs> it's, and by the way, it's out of his control too because shows get canceled and you, right. can't, you can't help that. You cannot help a show getting canceled. Uh, but you got to you gotta be diverse. You got to have all kinds of things happening in your career and you can't take it personally. Yeah. Do you find there's, do you see after such a long career, is there a common pitfall that a lot of people tend to fall into? Um, well, when things are going wrong, there's a sense of desperation in their read. Oh, um, you know, you, you, sure. you, I, I didn't go into this to make a dime. Right. Um, there's a there was a I don't know if you know who Paul Winchell was. Paul Winchell, um, he was the voice of Tigger. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, he was also a ventriloquist and had a kids uh, show. Oh, for years, I didn't know that. Decades. Um, but I had an audition with him early on in my career, and I said to him, "Do you have any advice for a brand new actor?" And he said, "Don't go into this for the money and never worry about money." And Smart. I said, I don't, I don't think my Jewish parents would, would, would agree. <laughs> and he said, well, here's the deal. If you go into it for the money, you'll never feel like it's enough. And you might meet your goal and go, well, my life isn't any different. Or you might be a millionaire and think my life hasn't changed. I'm still a miserable person. Yeah. Unrelated to the money I'm making. But if you, you're going to make money, you're going to lose money. You're going to make money, you're going to lose money. And if you spend your entire creative career worrying about money, all you're going to do is worry. If you just go in there to have a grand time, you know, I get a high at the microphone. I, I, totally. don't, I don't think about getting the job. Some of my most creative moments are the audition. In, in fact, remember that, that Spider-Man cartoon I mentioned to you? Yeah. So I was still living with my parents when I did that. Awesome. And, you know, a few weeks after the show, after recording the show, or I get the mail and I, 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 have, a, I have a letter and I open it up and it's a check. Oh. And, you know, at 18, it was a substantial check. Sure. And I'm like, like who is sending me money? Oh, my God, they pay you for this. <laughs> I had totally forgotten that they pay you for this because I was completely fulfilled just having the gig. Yeah. Wow. It's like, that's where you want to be. Like, that's the goal. Because then the reward is actually the work. You know, this is one of the reasons I don't like watching my work because sure, I, I did it years ago. I'm not in control of the edit. I'm not in control of, the, of what's cut, you know, from the story. And I can't go back and redo it. But my joy is in the doing, not the viewing. I'm too uh, picky. I'm a 
a perfectionist. And I'm like, sure. they use that take. <laughs> they, they cut my punchline. Uh, and, 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 but you got to let that go. And it's easier not to watch it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, dude. We've been talking for an hour already. You survived. Uh, I know. Oh, did you, you start? I thought we were. I didn't realize you started. <laughs> I, it started with weather in Florida, and it turned into making money. That's right. This is this is my show. This is how it works. There you go. I get you there comfortable, you and then I'm like, also existentialism. What's up? That's right. <laughs> there you go, dude. This was a joy. Uh, Thank you pleasure. so much. I well, yeah. before I let you go, I gotta ask, uh, where can people find you online? Talk to me about some things you got going on. Okay, let's see. So Instagram is. It's different different names for each platform. It's Bergen dot, Bergen dot Bob at on Instagram, at Bob Bergen on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I got a website. I'm easy to find. You can't, there you it, go. People who say I tried to reach you, I couldn't. I'm like, you're, you're such a liar. I'm, yeah. in the, I'm in the phone book. I really am in the phone book. Because <laughs> I, 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 I don't even know if I get one anymore. But I, did, I, I figured if somebody else wants to do what I did, they can look me up in the phone book. There you go. They got no excuses anymore. That's right. I love it. I love it. Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at BrianBalance.com. There you'll find all my demos and a bunch of other fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch! Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. Also, I've got a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Xavier, and Victor. Your support means so, so much, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.